Hello and welcome to the Disciple Science Podcast. I'm Dale Gentry. I'm an ecologist, a professor of biology, and a Christian. I find great joy and harmony in my life exploring science, studying birds, and in following Jesus. I started Disciple Science to help heal the tension between science and Christian faith and to help you connect with God through nature. I'm glad you're here to join me and occasional guests as we explore the intersection of science and Christian faith. Now, let's get on with the podcast. All right, today on the Disciple Science Podcast, we're going to be talking through uh, faith and the COVID-19 vaccine. Over the past year and a half of dealing with the pandemic, we've encountered a number of patterns and issues around our response to this infection. Among them, amplification of concerns about the safety and ethics of vaccination, not to mention differing views about the seriousness of the pandemic and the role of religion and politics in society. Today, we're joined by three university students who are all participating in a faith and the COVID-19 vaccine program put on by the Interfaith Youth Corps to talk about their experiences and perspectives as future healthcare providers and as Christians and as young adults offering their voices into the dialogue around the COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccine. So welcome to the Disciple Science Podcast, Christine David, Madeline Schwitters, and Kendall Luman. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. Thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. I thought we could get started just by having you introduce yourself and maybe give us a, just a little bit of background about uh, your interests uh, professionally, maybe a little bit about your interest in participating in this program uh, so that we can all get a sense of, of who we're speaking with today. And Christine, you're in the upper right of my screen, so why don't you start first? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so I'm Christine. I'm entering my senior year at Northwestern, and I'm doing the biology biochemistry double major. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and I would highly recommend it to anyone who loves science. Mm -hmm. um, if all goes according to plan, I will be applying to dental school next spring. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited for that. So Happy to be here, happy to be talking about the vaccine today and um, healthcare in general. Great. Mandy, why don't you go, or Kendall, yeah, why don't you go next? My name's Kendall. Um, I'm also going into my senior year and currently applying to dental school. So public health is definitely something on my radar and something I wanna get involved in. And over the course of the last year or so, I've been following the pandemic pretty closely. <clears throat> Um, I have connections to China, so ever since it started there, I've been pretty involved and um, interested. So when this opportunity came up, I thought, you know, this is a good chance to stop being an observer and start having a bit of an influence in these ideas. And of the last three here, I am also interested in dental, but my name is Maddie Schweeters. Um, I'm from the area local to um, Stillwater, Minnesota. Um, I actually recently graduated um, from the same university as the other two. Um, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in biology with a pre-professional pre-dental concentration. Um, as I said, I'm pursuing a career in dentistry and uh, I'm also currently applying to dental, um, dental programs around the country. Um, as Kendall said, I, I to relate to Kendall, I actually been volunteering for the last um, few months at a local, the M Health Clinic vaccination centers. And like you said, it was a lot of observing, but now I wanna like just put my foot, my feet in and tr actually try to do something about um, increasing those numbers because through volunteering there, I've seen going from 500 patients a day, going to 30, 100, like it's very minimal. So to get those amples numbers back up would be amazing, so. Great. So things are starting to trickle off as far as people's eagerness to get vaccinated. Great. Well, so if you can um, tell us a little bit about this program that you're participating in. Again, it's, it's through the uh, Interfaith Youth Corps. If you want to give us some sense of what the Interfaith Youth Corps is and the specifics of this program, what are you hoping to accomplish? What's the message that you're wanting to communicate? Uh, maybe even how, how you heard about this and, and how you're, um, uh, you know, you know what, what you're hoping to get out of it. And feel free to anybody just jump in as you, as you, uh, as you feel led. 
Um, I can go first, I guess, to kind of describe what we're doing here today. So um, us three were actually approached by Dr. Joanna Klein, who is the department head at University of Northwestern St. Paul. Um, she came to us regarding this opportunity um, that we we're actually speaking on today, which is through, the, as you said, the Interfaith Youth Corps or IFYC. Um, and I actually just recent, the, that program recently launched this program in whole, which is the Faith and the Vaccine Ambassadors Program. Um, and with this program, the pro this is kind of a project for students. Um, and the goal of that is to mobilize college students around the country and campuses around the country to basically address vaccine hesitancy and access in local communities. Um, but as we kind of just discussed earlier, Dr. Klein does want us to note that Northwestern as an organization does not necessarily endorse what we're doing or positions about the, um, about the COVID vaccinations, but um, they are looking to take a neutral stance on the idea of vaccinations as a whole. Um, uh, so that I put that out there as well. Um, so now that that is kind of out of the way. Um, so lately, um, we've been seeing both successes with the distribution of COVID-19 vaccinations, but we've also been seeing a lot of challenges that have come with this as well. And not just, there hasn't just obviously been successes with this. There has been a little bit of a pushback, um, but it appears that one of the greatest challenges with this distribution is the lack of access and trust in the vaccine, which is obviously very under, which is obviously understandable. Um, but we're here today kind of um, as students, a part of this ambassador program, we're here to basically try to provide access for, um, to communities and provide that trust of information. Um, Cause obviously there's a lot of misinformation out there that people don't know what to trust. Um, so we're kind of there to act as that um, just per people of information that hopefully they can trust in our communities being individuals from um, just from religious communities. So hopefully being able to approach religious communities and just people in general in our communities um, in the hopes that they can trust us with our information, especially as people that have science backgrounds. We've, we don't, we've taken, or most two of us now, I think Christine's taking it next year, but we've taken microbiology. We learn about, we learn about viruses. We learn about everything that has to do with viruses to the point that just beyond I thought I'd ever know. So <laughs> I actually put that with Dr. Klein. So she's very knowledgeable and she'll be a great guide through this whole thing. Um, so, but yeah, this program is basically just, I guess a unique opportunity for us to promote the, promote trust and access with the goal of increasing the number of vaccinated um, individuals in our country. Mm -hmm. And this actually just comes at a perfect time. I thought I'd mention this. Um, President Biden actually just recently announced that through June 4th through July 4th, um, it is the month of action, which basically means um, the goal of his um, the goal of his is basically just to increase vaccination rates to seventy percent of American adults um, before July fourth. So I think this is comes at a perfect time to be doing this podcast so we can share what we're doing in the coming months. Great. I think something that's pretty cool about this program is um, just how they're kind of reaching out to individual communities, like individual colleges. I think they've recognized that every community around the country is different. So they can't really blanket um, certain materials for everyone, but kind of just putting it in our hands and saying, you guys know your communities. What do you think will work? Um, we want, like they say, mobilize. We wanna mobilize you to do what you think will work best. So we're kind of empowered in that way to be creative, which is pretty fun. Yeah, I, I think that's great. Let's, let's just sort of put a pin in that and come back to that because this whole idea of every, Every community might have different concerns, um, different reasons for lacking access or, or trust. That just seems like such a big deal. You know, we are in a, a Christian higher ed community. We're in sort of in the suburbs of an urban environment. Everything about that unique location probably means we have unique challenges. And uh, I'd be curious to hear about how, how you are going to be dealing with that, but also, you know, people at other institutions are, are, are gonna be tackling those same challenges. So important stuff. Christine, do you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Oh, no, I think you guys put it all beautifully. Um, along with what Kendall said, I think when it comes to the vaccine and in terms of all this strong governmental push and nationwide campaigns that we've been having to encourage people to get vaccinated, um, with that, there does come a need for smaller in-house conversations um, where people can feel comfortable bringing up their concerns and having those addressed in a way that's both educational and empathetic. Um, so as Maddie's already talked about, you know, that's, that's been what we've been training for, what we've been learning how to do. Um, and we look forward to doing that in a way that 
um, would hopefully encourage people to get vaccinated and if not, at least give them an educated reason why they would choose not to, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's so important. You know, I think that uh, if you head down the wrong, uh, into the wrong corners of, of the internet or, or Twitter or whatever it may be, you, you find, you know, kind of some responses that err on the side of, of shaming people or of, uh, of, of criticizing and insulting people that hold an alternative position to whatever you hold on any given topic, right? And so how, how, how are you um, dealing with questions when, when people have concerns that, that maybe um, don't resonate with you? Or, uh, you know, I, I, let's, let's talk about some of, your, uh, some, some of your plan. How do you hope to reach out to our unique community of, of, uh, of religious college students in the suburbs of an urban environment? Um, how, how are you going to be reaching out to the university in, in the fall? Yeah, I can start with this one. Um, I was actually just reading on the Atlantic last night that um, they, they did a poll of the vast majority of communities that have said, hey, we're not gonna get vaccinated, hard pass for us. Um, and statistically, one of the greatest outlier groups was young evangelicals, mm -hmm. um, which was really interesting for me because uh, a lot of friends that I've talked to have, who have decided not to get vaccinated, their biggest reason why just has to do with uncertainty. Um, and I think that goes to what you were talking about, Dr. Gentry, with all the misinformation and things that we hear in the media that cause us to have doubts and just um, questions about what is this thing that everyone is encouraging us to put in our bodies. Um, so as a result of that, our goal is not only to foster open conversations about the vaccine, but also to be able to provide resources to members of our community, um, whether that be students or various other communities with our churches or nonprofit clinics that we're all, the three of us specifically, but all of us in our group, we're all involved in um, just providing guides essentially for people who have questions and concerns. Um, so we haven't nailed down a plan yet. We're still in the early phases of putting that together, but some ideas that have been thrown around are like social media campaigns or handing out information pamphlets. Um, essentially just being a catalyst for people who have questions and want to do more research. Mm -hmm. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when we're talking to people, I, I think humans are logical animals. We, we make decisions that are mostly like logical based on what we believe. So this COVID vaccine um, thing is like a pretty high level decision, something that is based on a lot of other factors. So something we heard in training and something that I think will be important when we're having conversations is just um, trying to get at the, the core of people's beliefs before we talk about the vaccine. Because um, if, you're, if, I'm talking, if I'm trying to promote something that's fundamentally somehow against a core belief that someone has, that's not gonna be effective. So if I can um, get down to the more basic beliefs and then start talking up from that um, and how it might, how the vaccine might be able to integrate into their beliefs. I think that would be somewhat more effective rather than spewing facts like, like we hear a lot on the news and stuff. Yeah, I think that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Manny. No, you can go ahead, you're good. <laughs> Well, and you know, as you were saying that, Kendall, you're, uh, it's interesting, you make the di dichotomy between we, we do want uh, to make logical decisions, but that facts alone aren't always, you know, enough, and the facts alone, sometimes even the facts are disputed, but we are, we're logical animals, but we're also very much influenced by our emotion, and it seems that, um, Christine, you, you said that there's, there's uncertainty that is, um, standing in the way of, of people deciding to get vaccinated. And it seems like that uncertainty is, is more of an emo it's all, um, emotional. It's like the, the uh, you know, the, either whether it's fear or, um, or mistrust, something that is st standing in the way of that. Um, and I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, is why is that you are all you know taking this position or the Innovative Youth Council of sort of sending ambassadors, right? You uh, have the role as as share with a shared worldview, a shared experience, um, a shared culture to go out and to and reach those people. Um, it, do you find differences in the um, 
the concerns, the the responses, the uh, around what information is reliable and what's not, what's trustworthy and what's not in young people that you've talked with versus uh, uh, an older community? Um, I can start with this one, I guess. Um, I would say that there is, in a sense, like both yes and no, that there is a difference between um, concerns with the older population versus with young adults, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, just that this whole thing, I guess, has been very politicized that we've been seeing. Um, I was, unfortunately, we would wish it wasn't. We wish it was just about public health and betterment of people's health, but no, it has become very politicized. Mm -hmm. And I would say more so for the millennial generations and our younger generations, just because the older generations, they do have that, um, they are like at more at risk for COVID, having more severe symptoms. So they do recognize that, luckily. They realize that. I am at higher risk of developing these um, more severe symptoms. So they go out and they get the vaccine because they've been, they hear from CDC or just published, published scientific journals, whatever you um, can add to that. But um, basically they do realize that they need to get vaccinated and that by them getting vaccinated, they can see their grandchildren again after a year and a half of not seeing them. I've heard stories of people that um, particularly just last week when I was volunteering at um, health Fairview, they, one of the volunteers said, I just got vaccinated and I haven't seen my grandchildren that live, I think it was somewhere on the East Coast. I haven't seen them for a year and a half. And that breaks my heart to think that people have gone this long because of COVID and that they've been restricted to their houses and have been restricted to what we called our normal, which this isn't normal. And people are growing up thinking that living with the mask is normal. And like people want to see, I know us three specifically, <laughs> we're dentists, I want to see people smile again and be able to have those connections with people face to face rather than as we're doing here on Zoom. So I think this will only, like getting vaccinated is only going to open up those new doors of opportunities for people and it's only going to bring us back to what we find as normal. Mm -hmm. So, but just reasons for why other than because older generations they, that I've seen tend to say oh I'm getting vaccinated in order to see my grandchildren again in order to basically just um, develop that immunity in order to not have those severe symptoms which is that's the goal of the vaccine it's not that if you get vaccinated you can't contract COVID it's that you aren't going to necessarily develop those more severe symptoms which is keeping those hospital beds open um, which is the idea of it, keeping hospitals open and having more beds available for those more severe cases of people and more severe injuries, as we saw before this, like if you had a car crash, things like that of those nature. Um, but with the younger generations that they're saying, I'm getting vaccinated because of this, there's such an array of reasons as to why they're getting vaccinated, oh. but it's just necessary, at least that I've found. Um, but like examples just kind of include wanting to I guess, strengthen your, just your immune system in general, because you might be facing those situations where you're going to go out just to the grocery store and you're going to come in contact with someone that does have COVID. And if you have that, I guess, introduced your immune system that the spike proteins of COVID-19, if you've introduced that to your body, you're not going to have as bad of a, I guess, reaction because your body's seen that before. It knows how to fight that off. And uh, like, that's just one of the reasons. And I guess there's a million other reasons of, oh, I work in a highly, I guess, um, high COVID, um, what's it called? High COVID like environment um, or high risk environment, excuse me. Um, just for those reasons, obviously I work at a dental office. That was kind of one of my factors on why I got vaccinated was I'm gonna be working with patients every day. I want patients, both myself to feel safe, but also for their safety to know that they're safe from me from potentially carrying a very contagious virus. So I guess there's just obviously, like I said, a huge array of reasons why across the board, why people are getting vaccinated, but that's obviously very personal reasons. So we're just kind of here to listen, not necessarily to spew our beliefs on the vaccine or to just simply spit out what we believe to be positives. Like we're here to listen first and to get what we need to know, like background information in order to share, I guess, individualized and personal information to each person just because each person's situation is going to be different on why they're choosing to get vaccinated or not to get vaccinated and we need to meet those we can't just be going against them so yeah 
But yeah. yeah, yeah, and just to to dovetail off of that, um, I think it goes back to what Kendall was talking about with understanding the basic underlying beliefs for why people think the way they do and why they um, do or do not get vaccinated. And so when it goes back to your question, Dr. Gentry, about is there a difference in the way that young people are approaching this as compared to the older generation? Um, I, th I think there is a vast majority or a vast discrepancy, I should say, with social media and um, videos that go viral on TikTok that have to do with the vaccine, which young people are very much a part of and um, the older generation is not. So um, as ambassadors and as we're in diverse communities, whether in the dental clinics that we're working in or um, wherever we are, just knowing how to address those kinds of um, different disparities in age that cause a difference in who people trust in their resources. And so that just goes back to having open conversations and understanding why people believe the way that they do. Great. Um, you know, th this program that you're participating in is also, it's a, it's a faith uh, a commitment as well, right? And so um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role that your faith, I mean, you are all Christians, but the Interfaith Youth Council involves people of, of all different faiths. What, what role does is your faith um, uh, play in your decision to, to be vaccinated or to, to advocate that others do the same? I can go first, always if Kendall wants to go first, because I know. Sure, I can I can talk about this. Um, <laughs> I guess this was kind of a bit of the, my journey to getting vaccinated had to do with um, Christianity. Um, I guess this whole thing about love your neighbor as yourself, right? That's kind of what, what um, this boiled down to for me. So at first I didn't understand that um, by not getting vaccinated, I was putting others at risk just to do with herd immunity. And um, once we're all vaccinated, the virus has nowhere to go essentially is the idea. So I thought, you know, wearing a mask is enough to keep people around me safe, but um, really getting vaccinated is the only way to protect the people around me. And I think um, that's kind of a mandate we have as Christians is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I want other people to um, you know, do their part to protect me. So I, I need to do the same. And that's kind of, you know, it's Christianity, but it's also just fundamental, like <laughs> human kindness, I guess. I'll go off, I guess what Kendall said. I honestly couldn't agree more. I was, I actually just recently got, I guess is three weeks from this upcoming Friday, I got my first dose of the vaccine. So obviously very late in the game. Um, I was just, honestly, I was very hesitant at first. There's just so much information that was out being spewed out there that like, what to, what should we be believing? Should we be trusting in the CDC? Should we be trusting in this? Like, there's just so much information, especially through the Christian community, because coming from a more, I guess, a school that's more conservative in a sense, it's harder to I guess, be open about this conversation and share our individual thoughts about the vaccine. So we weren't able to have, I guess, as much open conversation within our school as we probably would have liked, which is kind of unfortunate, but I would say just, there's just so much information being spread out there that I didn't know what to trust. Um, but now obviously I know a lot of those things that I was concerned about that was keeping me from getting vaccinated were are now untrue. I did my research. I obviously I was sat there one day and, uh, said to myself, why am I not, I guess, referring back to the information I have learned, my science background, I know what a virus does. I know how it infects a human body, how it affects a cell. It hijacks the cell's machinery. It doesn't change its DNA. It doesn't do any of that source, which is what obviously I was very concerned about. I was concerned about the huge infertility thing, being a young woman. So obviously things like that, it scared me, obviously, and not having a source that said, no, it doesn't do that, just straight there, like a uh, very popular, I guess, that first thing you search on Google. I'm not going to the 10th page of Google. I'm gonna look at the first page. And the fact that none of it said that just obviously scared me. So being able to refer back to my science background and being able to both have conversations with 
small under groups of people like Kendall and Christine that have got vaccinated as well. So, and obviously there are some other individuals at our university that were vaccinated. So going to them, talking to professors even that have been vaccinated and just kind of getting that, okay, I can get vaccinated. It's not going to do any of the things that I was concerned about. Mm -hmm. So, and what we learned from our training actually is that after the first dose, your 30, 33% of the COVID vaccine or COVID variants are covered. And then after the second dose, it covers 80%, which obviously there's a lot of variants out there. And that was what I was concerned about was, am I going to have to get a booster every year because of all these variants? Well, we've seen with the flu that they're always a year behind. So it's not covering that year. So it's like, what's the point? And that was always the question I was coming to was what's the point when, like Kendall said, we have to even look back to just human kindness in general, in addition to Christianity of loving your neighbor. That's the point is protecting both myself, obviously us young individuals. And that's kind of what we're trying to address is that young individuals are saying, I'm young. I have a good immune system. I am healthy. That's not the point of that. Yes, I have a strong immune system, maybe better than others, maybe not better than others, but there are those individuals that are more susceptible out there. And if I'm carrying it without me knowing it, and they're standing next to me without a mask and they get it, I could potentially be affecting their life in a completely different way that is life-changing for them. So you have to be thinking about that of not just yourself and putting yourself first in the situation. It is putting human kindness and the thoughts of other individuals first, which is definitely, I guess, the overarching idea of COVID. Like, I think what a lot of us have learned from the COVID pandemic is like getting, I guess, the importance of human kindness and the importance of having those interactions with your community. So if we can get back to that, that having a vaccination is definitely worth it to me. So that's great. Thanks for sharing, Maddie. Yeah. I'll, I'll wrap up the conversation here with my my story. I um I originally just got vaccinated um, pretty early on because I work at a clinic and it was part of just the regulations to keep working there. Um, so I really didn't do any research, which maybe was not <laughs> probably was not the best idea. Um, and I unfortunately had really bad side effects for about a week after my second dose, um, which is uncommon. Usually it's just a few hours, so not to scare anybody, but um, yeah, so that's, that was when I started doing research, you know, um, realizing like, why did I do this to myself? Why was this important? Um, and, and it was really fascinating to look into more the immune benefits, not only of the vaccine, but also just like we've been talking about the way that that is essential for us to be members of our community in a way that's kind and loving to those who are immunocompromised and are more vulnerable to the vaccine. Um, and I think as, as I've been thinking about this more and doing more research, like we can't forget that healing was such an important critical aspect of Jesus's ministry. And mm -hmm. so as we're talking about, do we get vaccinated? Do we not get vaccinated? We can't forget how important the restoration of our bodies is um, in God's work for ultimately redeeming our souls. And so I think um, the vaccine is one of those preventative medical measures by which we can um, be ministry or by, by which we, we can minister to our communities. Um, and so I think that our religious faith should play an important role in how we decide to get vaccinated or not. Um, and that's the conversations that we're hoping to have with people. Um, I wanted to read a really quick quote from Curtis Chang, who's a theologian who's been at the forefront of um, opening up these dialogues about vaccinations. And he says, um, the very nature of the vaccine is public health, meaning that it is just, a much, just as much about your neighbor as it is about yourself. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, that's a beautiful approach. You know, it, um, so much of the, of the dialogue and debate has sort of focused on what are going to be the re repercussions for me and, and myself, or what if I, you know, have these side effects or, um, or other concerns that might pop up. And I, it's hard to get out of, out of our own heads and think about um, the repercussions for our neighbor. And it seems like that that keeps coming up over and over again. And, and it's certainly core to our faith commitment that to some degree we're willing to think about the well-being of our neighbor just as much, if not more so, than ourselves. And, and I, I love hearing that. And I think that's um, something that we should continue to echo because it's just such a, 
a critical part of the ministry of Jesus, as you said. Now, a, a number of you have mentioned this word trust over and over again, and I, I think we are, um, you know, it's thinking back um, 20 or 30 years ago as the internet emerged, we've all thought, oh, how great it's going to be when we all have access to the same information. And now we realize that one of the unintended consequences is that we all have access to different information. And so how, how do you decide which resources are, are trustworthy? How do you wade through? I mean, Maddie, you even talked about like, you know, how far down the Google search do you, do you dig for information? How do you decide what to trust when you're, um, you know, looking for information about the, the vaccine or, or really uh, anything that's contentious? Oh, Kendall, you're uh, muted. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've seen a lot of people tend to let information come to them it's, mm -hmm. and not necessarily look for information. I know when I got vaccinated, um, the, the nurse asked me, do you have any questions? And I said, yeah, do you mind um, just showing me the ingredients? And she just like looked at me um, kind of confused and she was like, actually, I think we probably can do that. And <laughs> You know, as, as she was giving the shot, I was chatting with her and she said, oh yeah, I give, you know, hundreds of these shots a day and no one's asked me that before. So I just, it got me thinking like, are we taking our, our health and our understanding into our own hands or are we kind of um, letting other people kind of tell us um, what we should think? Because yeah, maybe, maybe I can't interpret these long organic chemistry names of what's in there, but um, you know, that, that's kind of a, a step of getting the, the data and looking at that, which maybe not everyone is willing to take the time to interpret, but I think there's something to be said for like, searching because that makes, makes the answer a little more um, edifying once you find it, I guess. Yeah, especially when we know the role that algorithms play in sort of giving us positive feedback loops and sending us things instead of yeah, I think that's that's wise, Kendall, to make sure that you're not just being fed information other than you're looking for on your own. Good. What what else? Yeah, I something that we're taught to do in training is when you're finding an article or looking at a particular resource, um, is just following the money trail and seeing, okay, who does this information financially benefit? And maybe that might give me a clue as to what their incentive is and whether or not I should find them trustworthy. Um, so when it comes to like big media outlets and news outlets that are publishing resources that may or may not be trustworthy, that's been helpful for me to just have those um, key guidelines that help understand bias, whether it's financial or political. Um, and, and we can recommend a few here that our um, training resources have provided to us, I think, um, Dr. Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH, has a blog where he'll give COVID updates um, and information that's going on. So I, I know Dr. Gentry, we talked about this <laughs> in your class um, earlier this semester, but he's been an incredible resource, especially for the evangelical community. Um, but on the other hand, some people don't trust him because he is working for the government. So it's also helpful to hear from other sources that aren't affiliated with the government. Um, and, and a helpful one for me has been Curtis Chang's website, and it's just um, christiansandthevaccine.com. Really easy to get to. He's interviewed a lot of different people, done a lot of different podcasts with um, the scientific and the social aspect of the vaccine. So he's been a great resource. And then also, um, and, and it, it's, he's a uh, seminary professor, uh, correct? He is. Yeah, yeah he's a I, I also so. appreciated uh, his, his work. So yeah, let's amplify that voice. It's great. Um, the only two other people I guess I would add to this, obviously, there's a, I guess, a debate on whether you should tr trust the CDC right now. But we did learn during our training that and two of the doctors that we actually talked to, which I'll tell you their names, it was Dr. Tanya Sorrell and Dr. Karen Graham. They actually did recommend the CDC just because they do have, the CDC is providing updated information at a very timely manner that we've been finding. So, but in addition to CDC, like the two doctors I just mentioned, they have great information they've been posting. Uh, I guess, I think they have blogs. I not 100% on the top of my head what they posted some things. I did look them up after our training, but they do know all things COVID. They're specialized in COVID and they know a lot of information regarding it. So anything that they say or that I at least have listened to from them, 
is definitely has calmed a lot of my nerves with COVID and uh, they just have a lot of information to share. And I think a lot of people, if they were to look up, I guess, information from them, it's trustworthy, at least that I've found. Um, but yeah, they definitely, during our training and specifically, they did shed, shed a lot of light on information that was causing a lot of that pushback from communities that we've been finding um, that's regarding the vaccine. So there's definitely a lot of sources out there. It definitely takes a lot of digging, I would say. Um, I know I've done my fair amount of research and I definitely relied a lot on my science background. So if, for people that don't have a science background, I'm sure it's hard when these big words are being thrown at them and they don't know what it means or even just spike proteins. People don't know what that means. And I know during when I was, I guess, being concerned about the vaccine, I was, I guess I remembered, oh yeah, there's spike proteins, but I didn't rely back on that information. I learned about what they, what the spike protein does with a capsule of a virus if it has spike proteins on it. So if they don't know what that is, they're probably, and they read an article, they're probably not gonna, I guess, notice that one word and go look it up separately. So they're just being fed information without knowing, actually knowing what it means because an article's not gonna spend the time explaining what a spike protein is. So if, I guess there's just a lot of information out there that isn't being explained. So if there were to be students like us that do have a science background, I think it's gonna help us specifically a part of our cohort because there's seven of us in our cohort of students. Um, I think we have a lot of benefit over others maybe just because we have that science background and we're able to, I guess, read a scientific article and di I guess kind of break it down into normal terms and uh, kind of just relate it to individuals. So. I think uh, us specifically being able to go out in our communities and share information that we've learned and kind of dump, not dumb it down, but just kind of break it down step by step and uh, I guess kind of like basify it in a way. Yeah, if we can do that, I think it'll be a lot very beneficial for individuals. Great. I, I wonder, um, uh, you know, the Christians, especially evangelical Christians have, a history of some tension uh, with, with science, you know, um, and there are, uh, so we all have, you know, friends and colleagues that have different relationships with science. And I wonder how much of that tension uh, is, is, is to blame for our, our current uh, discomfort with, with trusting scientists and physicians and epidemiologists. And do you have any um, suggestions from your experience or from the conversations you've had about how to address and overcome those sort of uh, concerns that, that um, at least I think s some certain corners of Christianity might feel like uh, scientists hold um, a worldview that's somehow contrary to, to my belief system. Yeah, I can start with this one. Um, there, there were members of my family who had those concerns and it, to be specific, um, especially in terms of um, how the vaccine is maybe a potential way for encouraging abortion because it comes from, a, it was tested on a fetal stem cell line. Um, and so within our family, we had to open up that conversation of, is this actually encouraging abortion? Can we be pro-life and be pro-vaccine at the same time? And it was really encouraging to just take the time to do that research and learn that in no way is this at all encouraging or connected to abortions today. Um, but also it was good for us to um, build trust and relationships in that way. And so I think when it comes to having open conversations, absolutely the answer is education and ensuring that we're doing our research in a way that's um, truthful and impactful, but secondly, also just building relationships. And I think, I mean, we're, we're just undergrad science students, so we're kind of at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to expert knowledge, but um, the basic background information that we can provide and the resources that we can connect people with um, is beneficial and has been beneficial in conversations. And so being able to build trustworthy relationships and establish empathy with people who have questions, I think that's, that's probably the biggest way that we're gonna be able to address those concerns that evangelicals have with science. To add on actually Christine's experience, I also have my, I'm the only individual in my family that's actually been vaccinated because um, I do come from a Christian family. Uh, I wouldn't say we're the top tier Christians, I guess you could say, but we do have a strong faith in that we, uh, I guess, just in general, I 
just guess to say I'm just the only individual that has been vaccinated but I have had those conversations with my family like Christine did and trying to I guess have a bridge because I definitely was more agreeing with them at first of all the possible negatives of the vaccine but obviously I took the time um, to go out and I guess research and find information about the vaccine that I could trust rather than just as my parents do hear information from the news or from whatever news outlet so a lot of people are relying on that information and I think that in, a, in and of itself is way far too politicized that's gone like we can't rely on that information necessarily so I think that if we people just need to take the time to go out um, for themselves to do research as I think us three at least have done and that is what strengthened our beliefs in the vaccine so especially um, I would say Christians just because if uh, I found at least that leaders in someone's church, if they have one belief about the vaccine, the rest of the community of the church probably will have the same belief as them because in their dialogue at church or mass, they're going to be, I guess, saying, I guess, sharing their beliefs on the vaccine with them without probably even knowing it. They don't want, obviously people aren't trying to push their ideas. And that's a lot of the pushback of individuals that aren't Christians. They say, Christians just pushed all their information upon us. And I think that's, what we're that's what we want to try to stay away from is that we don't want to be part of that stereotype that christians are pushing our beliefs on other individuals we want to be there to listen and we want to be there to i guess open up as individuals that are christians that are part of science and have a background in science that we can bridge that i guess the state between science and um, christianity and it's not that we're saying oh you need to believe everything science says no we want to just bridge, we're just talking about the vaccine. We don't want to go beyond that point because that leads to a messy, I guess, a messy plate. We don't want that. So I guess we need, I think for at least me, I just want to set the reputation of I'm here to listen and I want to hear people's concerns so that we can address those concerns. Because if I'm just sharing my beliefs and what I was concerned about, someone might not, someone's probably not going to resonate with that. Some people might resonate with it, but a lot of individuals probably aren't, and that's not their concern. And if I'm just spewing what I, like the reasons why I got vaccinated, it's not going to resonate with everybody. So if we're listening to all those concerns, we can resonate with more individuals and get up to that 70% of individuals that we want to be vaccinated by July 4th. So again, as we've been saying this whole time, we just need, we're here to listen and bridge that gap between science and Christianity. Yep. I, I love that emphasis on on listening and on relationships and on conversation, not a one way flow of information from let me tell you how it is. I think that's just so important to addressing not only concerns about um, the vaccine, but just, you know, the, the, this tension around science and faith that we have dialogue with uh, uh, people in and out of our faith uh, communities to just talk about what what they think and what they believe and why they believe it and uh, those uh, gracious dialogue can just go so, so far. That's great. Um, uh, Kendall, do you have anything you want to um, add to that? Yeah, I guess um, with this whole like believing scientists and trust in scientists, especially from the Christian populations, my understanding is that this is something that's been poor communication from scientists to the general public has been kind of a problem for years already. So this is a distrust that is based on years and years of poor communication. So it's not something we're gonna fix right now. It's not something that's gonna fix quickly, right? It's a wound that's been created and it takes longer to heal wounds than it does to create them. But mm -hmm. I think it's things like what you're doing. You're a scientist, but you're creating um, relatable um, and communication for specifically Christians, but um, mm -hmm. it's restoring trust in you as a scientist and hopefully things like what you're doing will translate um, into more trust in science as a whole especially in these christian populations great appreciate that you know i'd say the same for for each of you as you head out into the healthcare field and as you head out into graduate school and and beyond the, the confines of uh, of northwestern here uh, you know, the conversations that you have with, with people and the relationships you build uh, will go a long way to addressing, you know, these, these concerns and the perception that, that scientists can't be good Christians or that Christians can't be good scientists. And so it's, uh, we're, we're building bridges and that's encouraging. Let's, uh, you know, I think we're, we're sort of nearing the end of our, of our time here. And I will, uh, maybe we'll just wrap up by giving each of you an opportunity if you want to just um, 
uh, share a few closing thoughts or, or, or words um, about how you are um, uh, looking forward to, to doing some of that listening or, or the, the roles that you'll play on campus and having conversations with, with people um, and, and encouraging uh, people to, to consider the vaccine. So any, anybody wanna share any, any closing thoughts? Um, I can guess to share a little bit about what at least I hope to do in the coming months. Uh, this program spans between now and December. So obviously there's a lot of time, but maybe not enough time to try to do everything we mm -hmm. want to do. Mm -hmm. But ideas that I currently um, in, I have in my mind are just reaching out to the more underserved, underserved communities, just because I feel that there's a lot of, there's a large percentage of those individuals that aren't getting vaccinated just because of not having the right information or just not having that access to sites um, that are administering the vaccine. But I have been thinking maybe reaching out to homeless shelters in the area just to ask them and again, listen about what they are noticing. Their residents are more, I guess, um, what why they are having resistance against the vaccine. Uh, just because, because uh, if, if this resistance is more because of fear, uh, as ambassadors, we can, I try to alleviate that by going to those shelters and actually discussing with individuals face to face and having those personable conversations and again open conversations with people. Um, I think being personal with with people definitely resonates more if we're able to do that rather than giving them a pamphlet and saying here read this. If we can take if we can show that we're taking our time out of our day to educate them uh, just in a way to share uh, information that we believe is uh, trustable and worthy of acknowledging, I think that would resonate more with people. Uh, but if that, I guess, resistance is more due to a physical inability to get to vaccine centers, I think it'd be amazing if we could partner with places like M Health Fairview or any other um, chain of, I guess, clinics, if we could partner with them and try to do mobile clinics. I think that would be a great idea because obviously right now, Uber and Lyft, they're doing a, uh, where they'll do free rides. And I think if we were to do free rides, it's great, a great idea, but obviously with that COVID barrier in a small area, it does make for give us some conflict in that idea. But I think it'd be awesome if we could bring those vaccine clinics to them and find a way to just make it mobile because I think it would just allow for a larger percentage of the population to be able to get vaccinated just in the comfort of their area, their community, because there might not be a vaccination center in every community. And that's why people might be uncomfortable as leaving their community and leaving what they know. It's a form of formality for them. So I think that would be a big thing would be just making it more formal for individuals to feel comfortable in their space. And in addition to that, having that information that they can hopefully trust and hopefully that they can trust in us and our information. Uh, so I think, I, yeah, I look forward to working with these two specifically because we have that more science background uh, about COVID and especially this past year, I was in microbiology when the COVID pandemic hit. So Dr. Klein definitely, oh, when we went online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was, it was really interesting because we, half the class at the beginning of the semester, it was spring 2020 and we went online the second half and we definitely, that's when we started learning about viruses. So it kind of came at a perfect time for me yeah. to be able to connect it to like what was happening in my life right now. So I definitely learned a lot of information from that and it stuck with me as it's very personal to everyone right now. So I think be able to, for us to relate that information that we've learned from our educational backgrounds and actually use it and to do good and to help people through healthcare. Obviously, obviously we're healthcare, um, pre-healthcare students. So to be able to make a change in our community, I think that'd be really important and yeah, I think it'd be a great opportunity. So I'm really looking forward to this opportunity as a whole and working with, in this ambassador program because the especially the IFYC, uh, they have, or YC, they have a lot of great um, resources for us to use. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be working with them. Great. What, what an experiential education uh, opportunity to be taking microbiology <laughs> in the midst of a pandemic. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't have to work very hard to make it relevant. Anyhow, yeah. that's great. Thanks for sharing, Maddie. Mm -hmm. I think um, I'm interested in working a little bit with this, this group in America that is the most hesitant to get vaccinated, right? The evangelical Christians. Um, as, as much as I don't want 
as I don't like to say it, people listen to people that are similar to them. So, you know, who's similar to me, right? Young, white evangelicals. And that's the people that um, we need to get vaccinated if we're talking about boosting the numbers. So um, just based on who I am, I'm kind of in a position to um, reach that group. Um, and it's a, it's a group that ha already has strong beliefs and strong communication. So I think that'll be a challenge to um, think about how am I going to even approach that. But um, I think that's, that's the group I want to sort of move towards and um, think about reaching. Yeah, that's great. You know, it, it, as, as an ambassador, that you're certainly well positioned to to reach that that community. So, you know, that's that's. I think you'll have plenty of opportunities uh, this this summer and over the fall to to start those conversations. Great, Christine. What, yeah. what is wisdom? Oh. <laughs> um, I'm I'm also just super excited to learn how to do this more and do it well. I think um, we learned in our training that the more information you spit at someone and the more facts you throw at them, the, more, the less likely they are to believe you um, mm. and just become, or, or the less likely they are to trust you. Um, and so I think, you know, as we're opening up these dialogues with people and learning about why different communities have the concerns that they do, I'm really excited to become a better or more empathetic listener um, and to find out how to, how to balance that with speaking wisdom and truth. Um, I have a small background in education and I think, you know, I'm looking forward to starting projects that address misinformation. A couple other members on our team also have connections with um, the communications departments and they're trained in how to do that well. So I think I, I'm looking forward to educating others and educating myself on how to do this in a way that, that's kind, but also um, speaking in truth and making sure that we, we aren't believing the misinformation that's coming out about the vaccine. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for having us, Dr. Gentry. <laughs> oh, no problem. It's a pleasure to speak with you. It's encouraging to hear about the work that you're doing and that the Interfaith Youth Council is doing. I am, um, you know, wanting to be that ambassador in my own community as well. Although I, I think that, um, you know, but I'm, I'm in a little bit older age uh, group and where I think there's a little bit less hesitancy, but uh, I'm just really encouraged by all, all the work that you're doing. And thanks everybody for, for coming on and for, and for your work. I'm excited to uh, share about the work that you're doing and I look forward to hearing about the conversations that you'll have this summer and, and over the fall um, when we return to class uh, here in, in August. So uh, thanks again for coming on and have, uh, have a wonderful summer. You too, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Disciple Science Podcast. At Disciple Science, we believe that integrating science and Christian faith can inspire a fuller knowledge of God. We produce this podcast and our videos to help you connect with God through God's creation. We are a crowdfunded nonprofit based in St. Paul, Minnesota, if you want to support us, you can give by visiting our website at disciplescience.com or you can give at patreon.com slash disciplescience. I want to thank our guests for joining us today and Caleb Davis for producing this episode and for composing our theme music. I'm Dale. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk again soon.